Um, my name is Nadia Rubai. I am one of the co-directors of the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention. Um, if you're not already familiar with that institute at Binghamton University, um, one of the things that we do is we try to um, connect the academic world with the world of practice so that this um, study of atrocity prevention is not just something theoretical it is actually something very practical that um, is on the ground and occurring in many um, ways shapes and forms by people all over the world before we go any further i want to acknowledge um, that binghamton university um, sits on the ancestral lands of the haudenosaunee people specifically the oneida and onondaga um, and then I'm speaking to you from the lands of another group of Haudenosaunee, the Cayuga. And um, we, we like to start with those types of land acknowledgements with IG map events or institute events um, to acknowledge that um, we are, um, ex we are um, privileged, um, the privileges that we have we're experiencing because other people in part as a result of suffering that other people have had. Um, in the past, um, and that those um, land disputes are often defined as if they're about land, but they're actually about people. They're about people's lives. They have real impacts on people's lives and the cultures. Um, and so those conflicts are, are important um, for us to acknowledge. And what we have the advantage, uh, the opportunity to do this week with these events um, coordinated with the Parent Circle Family Forum um, is to look at the creative and very personal ways um, that people are working to dismantle systems of hate and dehumanization, um, how they are addressing those issues um, at an individual level and how that can have a wider impact. We're looking to use these events this week to learn more about the situation in Israel and Palestine and to look for lessons um, that we can apply in other contexts um, as ways to build societal resilience, to promote peace, um, to reduce risks of mass violence, and to improve a general sense of humanity in the face of so much um, dehumanization. Um, so for those, I know some people here have been part of some of the earlier events this week. You may have heard Rami um, speak um, uh, on Monday. You may have watched a video um, in which he was featured, a documentary film on Tuesday. Um, you may have been part of some of the events um, yesterday. Um, today we are joined, I hope, we're joined by at least one, but hopefully two um, individuals who are also going to share their, their stories of loss and their stories of reconciliation. Um, and in this case, so I'm going to introduce very briefly Gal Elanan, um, who also happens to be Rami's son. Um, so if you listen to Rami and Bassan um, on Monday, uh, this is an opportunity to hear from their sons. Um, but as in their own right, their experiences um, of loss and reconciliation. Um, because you, we provided brief bios in the registration materials, I'm not going to repeat those for you. And I think their stories are best told um, in their own words. So I am going to turn things over um, to Egal. I'm going to suggest um, that for those of you who are here that you keep your video on, but you may want to switch um, to um, speaker view or presenter view um, so that you can actually see Egal and it's not in a sea of faces. Um, and then when we return to discussion um, after that, we will have top opportunity for questions and answers after that. Um, we'll go from there. So Egal. Uh, thank you so much, Nadia, and thank you everyone for being here and uh, hearing um, and going to hear. Uh, our stories. Uh, Nadia, I think it will be best, um, although I will try to uh, represent my brother Ara Baramin uh, to the best of my ability, I think maybe so we'll have uh, a possibility to hear him in his own voice. We can start with the video and then uh, get back to the stories. Absolutely. Would you like me to, I have either the video just of him or the video of the two of you? I, can do so I think maybe the, the video of just of him and then uh, we'll move on. One moment. And get that ready. Okay. All right, so I'm going to up, share yeah. my screen. 
I heard him. He's here. Ah, no, no, no. It's the video that we hear. I'm sorry. Ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hold on. Let me stop that and share the screen first. Thanks for your patience with my technology. All right. Here we go. Me. بالأمس كنت ذكيا لذلك أردت تغيير العالم اليوم أصبحت حكيما لذلك أنا أغير نفسي إن العمل على تغيير الواقع الفاسد إلى واقع أفضل لن يحدث بالتمني وإنما بالعمل المتواصل لأصحاب الهمم العالية والإرادة الصلبة لكن الخطوة الأولى هي ابدأ بنفسك قبل أن تغير الآخرين عندما كنت في الثانية عشرة من عمري وجدت نفسي مشاركا في لقاءات حركة جديدة تسمى مقاتلون من أجل السلام لا أعرف عنها شيئا ولم أفهم في حينها هدف هذه الحركة ولم يكن لي خيار في ذلك كنت أذهب برفقة والدي بسام عرمين ولم أكن أدرك استحابه لي في اللقاءات مع الإسرائيليين لم أفهم لغتهم وبعد سنة تقريبا وجدت نفسي مشاركا في لقاءات منظمة أخرى وهي منتدى العائلات الثكلة المشترك وذلك بعد مقتل شقيقة عبير وهي في العاشرة من عمرها برصاصة جندي إسرائيلي بعدما خرجت لاستراحة خلال دراستها في المدرسة في عام 16-1-2007 وأيضا لم يكن لي خيار في ذلك فالرصاصة التي وضعت حد لحياتي وأحلام عبير يبدو أنها أن لا خيار لها إلا الوصول للهدف وهو رأس عبير والبندقية أيضا بلا خيار إلا تنفيذ الأوامر والجندي أيضا كان ضحية لتاريخ طويل من من صنع الخوف فالكل ضحية لكن الضحية الكبرى كانت عبير خلال السنوات القادمة واجهت تحديات كبيرة وصعبة من مشاعر القهر والغضب والرغبة الشديدة في الانتقام ليس بسهولة وجدت لي مكان في اللقاءات التي أخذت إليها لكن مع الوقت وجدت النور الذي أضاء لي الطريق إنه النور الذي أنعم الله به علي بواسطة إنسان تعجز كل الكلمات عن وصف إنسانيته إنه والدي بسام هذا المقاتل الصلب الذي أمضى سبع سنوات في السجون الإسرائيلية هو الذي علمني التسامي على الماضي والانطلاق دائما نحو الحياة فقد انتصر على السجان من خلال تمسكه بابتسامته المعتادة وهدوئه الهادر وشموخه الصارخ وتواضعه الدائم علمني أنني لست قاتلا والانتقام هو طريق الضعفاء والجبناء نحن لا ننتقم نحن نقاوم من أجل هدف نبيل نقاوم من أجل الحياة وليس من أجل الموت 
خلال السنوات الطويلة علمت بوجود شراكة قوية بين والدي ورامي الحنان والد اسمدار لكن لم أشعر بأنني جزءا من هذه الشراكة وأيضا لم أعرف إيجل أخ اسمدار الحنان واليوم إن عضوية التي أفتخر بها حركة مقاتلون من أجل السلام ومنتدى العائلات الثكلة هو خياري أنا وأتشرف بتمثيلهم والعمل برف معهم برفقة عدو السابق صديقي وشريك الحالي إيجل السادة الحضور إن العقبة الوحيدة التي تقف أمام الشعبين هي الاحتلال الإسرائيلي الذي هو مصدر العنف والتطرف وسفك الدماء فالاحتلال جعل حياتنا جحيما لا يطاق الموت يتربص بنا عند كل حاجز عسكري الاعتقالات والإهانات اليومية أصبحت أسماؤنا ولون بشرتنا وجنسيتنا ولغتنا لعنة وتهمة جنائية نعاقب عليها وهنا أقول لحكام إسرائيل إن سياسة الاستمرار في قمع الشعب الفلسطيني لن يجلب لكم الأمن وهنا أدعوكم أن ترفعوا بنادقكم عن أحلامنا أطفالنا شوارعنا رياضتنا الماء والهواء لا تقتل, لا تقتل الأمل فينا وفي الختام أنا وإيجل سنستمر في الطريق في طريق والدانا وكما كان يردد والدي دائما نحن لا نتحدث عن السلام بل نحن نصنع السلام لذلك قررنا مقاتلون من أجل السلام ومنتدى العائلات أننا لن نستسلم أبدا وسنواصل الكفاح حتى يتحقق السلام الانتقام الوحيد لدماء عبير عرمين واسمدار الحنان هو صنع السلام وشكرا Okay, Nadia, should I start? Yes, please. So thanks again. Uh, good thing we started with the uh, Arab's uh, speech alone because you're going to have enough of me for the past, uh, uh, for the next hour. Um, I would like to start with, uh, with one of the most important um, points that uh, Arab, my brother, said in his speech um, that this work, and some of you have heard, Uh, my father and Bassam a few days ago is to, con for us, is to continue um, in the path uh, of our fathers who are the um, original or true revolutionaries in the concept of bereaved families, uh, Palestinians and Israelis uh, meeting together. And for this, for, for us, it's a huge honor, for me, it's a huge honor. Uh, and I'm a bit excited uh, because You guys are here, and of course, my father is, uh, is right amongst you. Um, I was born on the 6th of September, 1992 in West Jerusalem, up to a certain point in my life, um, because of 
um, reasons that uh, differ from uh, segregation between Jewish and Palestinian communities in Jerusalem, and I'm not using this word lightly to an American audience, um, and to socioeconomical and class uh, differences. For me, Palestinians were nothing else but uh, this ambiguous, scary kind of a other kind of conglomerate living on the other side of the number one road in uh, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, just uh, so uh, just to say, it's a city of almost a million people. Three hundred and fifty thousand of them are Palestinians. Um, but for me, growing up in Jerusalem, there was no kind of connection whatsoever, and it is not by chance. Uh, Palestinians for me were people that could have, uh, you know, uh, put gas in my parents' car or built the houses around our home. Uh, storyless, faceless uh, people. Um, that reality changed for me completely, 180 degrees. Um, two days uh, before my fifth birthday, on the 4th of September, 1997, um, five girls from the Gymnasia Ivrit High School in the city center of Jerusalem um, left the school in the middle of the school day. Uh, they told their parents and their teachers they're going to buy uh, textbooks. Probably they planned on doing something a little bit more fun than that, skipping school in the beginning of the school year. Um, that group met with Another group of three people, um, three very desperate, uh, very angry, probably vengeful, as the statistics teach us, uh, Palestinians that came out from a refugee camp near the city of Nablus, wearing to their bodies uh, detonation belts and grenades. Uh, these two parties met in uh, Ben Yehuda Street in the city center of Jerusalem in the suicide bombing. Uh, seven people were killed, um, three uh, Palestinian bombers and four Israeli civilians. Uh, Yael Botwin was killed instantly. Sivan Zarka, another one of the girls, was killed instantly. Daniela Birman uh, is still rehabilitating from a very, very severe brain injury over uh, almost now uh, 24 years later. Uh, my sister, Smadar El Khanan, was killed instantly from a shrapnel of the bomb that hit her in the back of the head, and another Israeli young man. Now, before we'll get into the political context, and we will, because this story has a political context, only the only context is, it, it has, um, I would like to invite you to have a short glimpse to try and imagine, and I hope no one here has experienced um, such an experience to the heart of a family which loses a loved one violently, abruptly. I would like you to imagine a body that is all of a sudden missing an essential organ or limb, something internal on an arm, a leg, something that you will always feel its absence and that will never grow back um, and that will define uh, the, rest of, the rest of your life. Um, and this was uh, most certainly um, the case for us. Um, my family shortly after uh, the bombing joined uh, the parent circle in 1999. Uh, they had political background uh, beforehand, an activist political background. My mother was uh, active uh, in an organization called Four Mothers who advocated for the um, withdrawal of the IDF uh, from Southern Lebanon, which my brothers, my older brothers served in the IDF in, in Lebanon, one of them at the time. Um, my grandfather has his own uh, political story, but for me, it was a whole different reality. Most of the political activity I did at the age of five was you know, building settlements in the sandbox of my kindergarten, nothing uh, more than that. Um, and after Smada's death, um, I took it to heart and I had this feeling which was quite different uh, from his family's um, approach, from my father's approach, from my mother's approach, that has nothing to do with anyone. This is our own personal tragedy. Smada was killed. Smada was killed, that's it. Um, and this is something that we need to deal in our own intimate family cell. This is our own personal trauma. And with this feeling, I grew up. I grew up 
um, during the Second Intifada in Jerusalem, the Al-Aqsa Intifada, um, a series of uh, um, Palestinian attacks inside a civil population in Israel, and of course, uh, during the ongoing uh, occupation, Israeli occupation of, uh, uh, over Palestine and Palestinians. Um, we lived near the city center of Jerusalem, the sound of the bombings, the, you know, if you ask uh, three people from Jerusalem that grew up around the same period, the conversation will always lead quite shortly to how many times have you been near to a suicide bombing and didn't die. And this is something casual, you know. Um, and with this burden, I, I carried on again, not connecting uh, the dots, uh, being angry at my parents who are connecting the dots the way that they did. And this, how come you need to be always against everything? How come you need always to be, you know, so critical about our country, about what we're doing, etc. And I think I came to understand um, this important um, approach or view of the world and the necessity of being active against it um, in two different occasions. Uh, the first one, and here it's for me a good opportunity to embarrass my father, was uh, when I was around uh, eight years old. Uh, when I was eight years old, it was the middle of the Second Intifada, um, the middle of uh, Operation um, Protective Wall, I think it's the uh, translation into English, which was the occupation, the reoccupation of the West Bank after the withdrawal of the IDF, the so-called withdrawal after the Oslo Accord, the IDF in the 2000s reoccupied the West Bank in a very, very bloody uh, campaign, over uh, one million bullets shot in uh, the refugee camp of Jenin alone. Um, many, 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 many casualties. Um, many um, house demolitions, orchard, vineyards demolitions, orchard demolitions inside uh, the West Bank, Palestinian. Um, orchards and vineyards, um, and my father showed me a picture that went, that was quite famous at the time of an old uh, Palestinian man uh, inside his field standing in front of a, um, an Israeli IDF D9 bulldozer, and he asked me, Igal, which one is stronger? Which one of those two figures in the picture being an un- uh, and not a very sophisticated child. I answered the correct answer, physically speaking, of course, the D9. Uh, and then my father told me, no, I think it's that man opposite, standing in front of that thing. And this is something that um, I carried with me. I think this, the second time that, uh, that these dots connected for me, uh, when I was 14 years old, it was the age that um, Smada was uh, when she was killed, which is naturally an age, uh, you ask yourself a lot of questions, some better than others. Uh, but one of the good questions I asked was why? Why here? What happened? What's the background? What, what, what happened to my family? Why it needed to happen to us? And I went online. Um, and I learned the number a figure that back then shook my world. And I hope uh, will, shook you, will shake yours um, as well, um, in 1996, one year before Smada was killed, Benjamin Netanyahu, our current uh, emperor, uh, prime minister, uh, came to power for the first time. Um, in one of his most uh, flamboyant and uh, cocky, if I may say, speeches from 2003, Benjamin Netanyahu says they were only um, three suicide attacks inside the Green Line during his first time in office. One of those attacks is, uh, is our attack. And uh, between 96 and 99, 220 people lost their lives between the Jordan River and the sea. This is not including Southern Lebanon that I mentioned. That means 100 Israelis and 120 Palestinians that have joined the dysfunctional family that both Arab and myself are part of, uh, the family of the bereaved. That, that number, um, you know, added to the fact that Palestinians were no longer this faceless, ambiguous thing for me. I had, by that time, I was part of the youth activities of the Friend Circle. I had Palestinian friends, I had Palestinian 
um, peer. Um, I met Urud Abu Awad, who lost her uncle. I met uh, Muhammad al Bao, who lost his brother Firas. Um, I met uh, many, many, many other of the uh, 300 Palestinian members that we have in the parent circle. And I've been to the West Bank. I've, I've realized this reality. You know, these two facts together made me understand that, you know, this is not something written from above. This is not a singular case that chance made it happen so that my sister was there during the bombing. This was a reality of uh, political decisions made by men and women uh, just like ourselves in order to gain political currency. Now, what Benjamin Netanyahu failed to recognize in his speech from 2003 was that during one of, the, one of his first uh, things uh, that he did when he came to office was opening the Kotel tunnels. The Kotel tunnels are tunnels that go underneath the Western Wall underneath Temple Mount, Haram Sharif, uh, one of the most sensitive and delicate places in the world, and was certainly the, the most sensitive and delicate place uh, in Israel and Palestine. And as retaliation, uh, although he was advised against it, but by all security branches, the retaliation to the opening of the Kotel tunnels was a very, very violent and big outbreak of violence, um, which resorted again in one of those three attacks that changed my life. I think the second time that I've met uh, Smada's death in a political context, and I think that was the time that um, made me uh, realize that I need to take an active part against the occupation and against the injustice. Um, was before I joined uh, the Israeli army. I was a soldier between 2011 and 2014. I wasn't a combatant soldier because bereaved families in uh, Israel, uh, the parents need to sign a legal document and luckily my parents did not agree uh, to sign that document. Um, and before I joined, I was part of, you know, I was a youth counselor in one of our summer camps we hold every year a summer camp for bereaved Israeli and Palestinian children. This year, it was via Zoom, unfortunately, but the uh, Arab and myself were the uh, managers uh, of this camp. Um, and after, you know, being a counselor at the camp and a few days before joining the army, I had a real salad in my head. I had a big dilemma in my hands. And first, um, I thought about refusing, refusing to join the Israeli army to become a conscientious objector like many of the young heroes and heroines that we have every year that are quite silenced uh, by the mainstream media. Um, but on the other hand, um, I wanted to be part of my society. And this is something that we need to, uh, to look at. I think if, we need to, if you want to understand participation of mostly young men and Israeli men and women inside the mechanisms of the conflict is that after being 12 years in an Israeli uh, public education system, the one thing that you believe will make you be part of your society, will make you contribute to your society, will make you um, an essential potential leader of the society is to join the Israeli army. This is, let's say, an equivalent, if we're talking about social mechanisms, of a college in the USA. Something that will determine how much you'll be part of the society after you do it. So with this dilemma, I went around a week, a week or two before I joined the army, and we came to sit a few friends from the parent circle, some Palestinian members of the parent circle, some Jewish members of the parent circle, my father included, my brothers, uh, sitting in Bejala. Bejala is an area C, one of the only areas that uh, Palestinians and uh, Israeli Jews can meet without having um, to fear being persecuted by the government if you enter a territory which is control controlled by um, Palestinian Authority, you risk yourself, this is rarely enforced on Jews, but you risk being um, put up to three years in jail and paying $50,000 fine, which is a little bit over $10,000. So Area C, which is a result of the Oslo Accord, is one of those places 
uh, we can meet sitting there, one of the Palestinian members of the parent circle, I talked, you know, about what's going had to happen and the dilemmas, etc. And one of the Palestinian members of the parent circle told me something that I will never forget. He told me, Igal, I love you uh, like family, I love you like a son, we were truly very, very, very close. But once you're going to put on their uniform, I will stop speaking to you. Now, at the time it offended me deeply. I wanted to get up and tell him, how can you say that? You know the dilemma, you know where I come from, et cetera, et cetera. But back then I had some tact uh, left. I didn't do that, but I carried this with me. Now, in the army, I worked, I, I was part of the education corps, which is a topic for a whole different lecture if you want to talk about militarized society um, topics. I worked in a school, uh, in one of uh, Jerusalem's um, low social, Jewish low socioeconomical neighborhoods bordering the eastern part of the city where Palestinians live in the neighborhood of Armon and Atziv, which is bordered by Jabal Mukaber and Surbacher, which one of those neighborhoods is also a refugee camp. Now I work there in a Jewish school uh, with the kids, uh, what we call uh, education to values, which by definition my job was to encourage them to join the Israeli army. I did something a little bit different than that though. Um, and close to the end of my service, I went on to the bus, I put on my headphones, I had my uniforms on. I didn't really want to speak to anyone. It was a long day, but with me to the bus came on a 17 year old Palestinian boy. Now we didn't speak, but we didn't need to. I don't know his name, I don't know where he's from, but the way that he looked at me told me everything. He told me exactly the story of that sentence that the dear friend told, that told me three years beforehand. He looked at me the only way possible for young Palestinians to look at young Israelis um, giving this current power balance and political situation. He looked at me as his oppressor. He looked at me as his occupier. He looked at me as a soldier that might have obtained his family at the checkpoint a few hours the day before. He looked at me as the soldier that might have entered his house. He looked at me as a soldier that might have taken him into custody with no uh, trial and no uh, not being a, not to not appear in front of a judge without any kind of due process, and that made me realize um, the grave grave part that young um, Israelis take upon themselves in this conflict. Sometimes unknowingly, sometimes out of the pure um, agenda or um, thought that in order to be part of the society, this is what we need to do. And the military has this kind of neutral um, feel to it, but there's nothing neutral about it. Um, after that experience, I decided I will no longer be looked upon as a symbol of anything, but if I must, I'll be looked on as a symbol of um, persistent, um, fierce struggle against the occupation and for justice in Israel and Palestine. Um, I was discharged um, from the military and I started to, and I joined the parent circle as an active member, um, but this time as a young man and other organizations. And this is what I generally uh, also do in my life um, now. Now this is the story that led me uh, to become active in this uh, kind of field of work. And I think um, looking at the time, uh, maybe it will also be a good time now to open it uh, uh, for questions. And then maybe if Arab will join a bit later, he'll also have some time to say something. Okay? Thank, Thank you, Miguel. Thanks so much for, for sharing that story. Um, I'm going to give students an opportunity in particular, to, um, but everyone is welcome to um, ask questions. Please use the raise hand function because otherwise we can't see you all. We have to go through three screens to, to see um, things, but I'm going to take the liberty of, of asking, making a comment more so than a, than a question because this, the last part that you point that you just made about um, this young Palestinian, um, you know, getting on the bus looking at you and, and your words were looking at you in the only way that he could as his oppressor, as his occupier. Um, it really struck home, I, I think, in the context of the United States. Um, one of the, the privileges that white people have is often to look at um, conflicts around race um, or to look at um, Black Americans who, who 
are criticized for framing everything in terms of being a racial issue. Um, and, and you often hear white people saying, you know, it's not always about race. Why do they always have to make it about race? And I think you really drove home the point of it's not a choice. It actually is the only way to look at things. Either you are a symbol and a part of being the oppressor, or you have to be actively involved in trying to change that. Um, is kind of that transition that you made. Um, and part of that is taking off the uniform, but part of that is also in the way you live your life. And I think that's a really powerful um, uh, an analogy that you gave in your context that has very direct applicability to the, to the US current context as well. So thank, I just wanted to thank you for sharing that in those terms. Thank you, Nadia. I'll, I'll, I'll take what you say um, and, and, and use it a, a little bit also. Um, you know, Arab uh, in, his, in, in our joint lectures usually quotes uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, by saying um, that the thing that we will remember is the silence of our friends and not the actions of our enemies and not um, what our allies did, of course, I'm paraphrasing. He, he, he's the one with the quotes and he has them good and all packed up. Um, and this is something that we need to realize about joint activism against the occupation in general. Now, I'm sitting here in front of you in a relative, you know, I, li I live currently in Haifa, uh, which is a city in the northern Israel. I have a free life. I can move wherever I want. I have uh, the, all of the privilege all the privileges that the Jewish citizen in Israel has, I feel like the majority, uh, every political party will talk about the things that I am interested in, that are interesting to my life, but Palestinians do not have this privilege and do not have the privilege at all. They don't have the privilege, this privilege also being Israeli civilians living inside the 1948 borders, being marginalized and uh, discriminated against in terms of budget and policy. And furthermore, living under military rule in the West Bank, where freedom of movement is, uh, um, is, is not something that you have, freedom of occupation, freedom to education, every, almost every human right, you know, that uh, we can or I can uh, think of something that is completely, uh, not, this is ordinary, this is how I live my life, my Palestinian party does not have that. And this is something very interesting to understand about joint activism against occupation and, and for justice, there is no symmetry. They cannot be symmetry. Um, Arab uh, is a hero. Arab is transcending above um, the very, very severe and heavy circumstances of life, adding to that being a bereaved brother and decides to come every day and work with me. Now, this is a humbling experience for me. But it's also something very, very interesting to understand in the sense that we're talking about a place that the reality of this place creates, of course, the destruction and the death that I am, beside other things, also a victim of. But we live in a place that has one ruling system. Some of the people that live under that system have certain rights and the others have none. And this is something that is important to say here. Um, before we um, before before we dive in into into anything else, and I think this is also, if I might add, um, what is so important about the parent circle and organizations like us. There's no organization like us, I think, worldwide of bringing bereaved people that are in in conflict as as we speak. But let's say combatants for peace, the Irish, other organizations that bring Palestinian and Jews to work together against the occupation. Um, the radical approach here is not from our side, the Jewish side that comes, and we want to fix this because this ruins our country as well, but the radical approach is from a Palestinian partner that's saying, despite everything, we are still willing to work with you. And this is something that we need to say thank you about every day um, that is happening. Shukran. What questions do people have? Elizabeth, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for sharing your and Arab story. I thought that it was so, so inspiring and eye-opening to listen to. Um, and my question is, if you are confronted with hatred about your views about creating 
this peaceful dialogue between Israelis and Palestinians by your friends or even by people you've lectured before who hold very opposing um, opinions to you. And I don't know if you could speak on behalf of Arab, but I was wondering if, um, if he's experienced any hatred from his Palestinian friends or family members or people he's lectured on the views he's hold for like almost betraying, uh, if you would say like his friends and family and the same question kind of applies to you of this like maybe like betraying attitude that your views may hold. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I choose my friend carefully. So on, the, on that part, uh, everything's okay. Um, but second, um, and for, unfortunately, yes. Um, I, I, I must say, I, I've, I've been to the West Bank, I'm going, I've, I've been around, I, I never faced any kind of, uh, you know, uh, violence or I didn't feel afraid in any house that I've been in, but in the streets of Tel Aviv protesting uh, the, bo the bombing in Gaza, um, I, I was, you know, chased down and uh, people tried uh, to hurt me physically. So this is something to teach us also about, um, let's say, the, uh, the meaning of the occupation inside Jewish Israeli society, uh, that everything is escalating and very, very, very quickly. I think it, it, it happens in the whole world. I don't need to tell you this, uh, living in the States. Uh, only today I read in the news that um, an ultra-Orthodox family was attacked by knife point in uh, Central Park, uh, racism and shootings and against anyone who is not, uh, doesn't, didn't look like your uh, former president and your current president, in fact. Um, but, um, and this is something very important to say, for instance, and I'm sure maybe uh, the last lectures talked about it, um, but the parents uh, circle together with combatants for peace hold every year a joint memorial service. This is the speech that you saw uh, I'm speaking at the beginning is from there. Um, we hold a joint memorial service in the day um, that is uh, the, traditionally, uh, we state the um, Remembrance Day for uh, Israeli casualties of terrorist attacks and uh, people who died in war, soldiers. Um, and we decided to hold a joint ceremony. Now, the first uh, joint ceremony in 2007 had 400 people in a fringe theater in Tel Aviv. Uh, the last ceremony, um, had over 200,000 views online. It was via Zoom. And the one before that had 7,000 people. The one that we spoke at in 2016 had 5,000 people. This is growing exponentially, you know, like, like, like the coronavirus cases. It, it grows the same. Now, if we're talking about um, points of hope inside our society and inside our, both of the societies. This is one of them. One of the ceremonies in 2017, um, the Israeli defense minister, and they're doing the same kind of stance every year since then, um, banned the entrance of our Palestinian activists to the ceremony. So we decided to hold a, a parallel ceremony inside the West Bank in Bejala. Now, I, I went to that ceremony. I went off the bus and I saw 700 people mostly Palestinians, coming to remember the death of also Jewish uh, deads in this conflict together with me, but in the West Bank, okay? Now this is something that if you think about it for a second, it's almost incomprehensible. There's no reason for them to do that. If I was in their steps, in their foot, in their shoes, I don't know what, if this is what I would have done. But the images of solidarity and the potential of joint society eh, between he, here between the Jordan River and the sea are evident every day. So we have on one hand, the process of uh, fascization, escalation in violence. It is less safe uh, to speak your views out loud. You will be called a, um, a traitor, etc. But on the other hand, in those kinds of activities, little pockets of hope, we are able to remember the glorious past that Jews and Arabs had in this region, if we're talking before Zionism. Now, I, I'm, I'm a student of history. This is, uh, this is what I do. This is the uh, topic also that I'm interested in. And the hostility between us is important. We brought it here from Europe. 
there was never a chance, there was never a situation, except, you know, specific cases, of course, but in general, there was never a situation in this region that Jews and uh, Muslims and Christian didn't feel that they can live together. Now, inshallah, this will happen again sometime soon. I hope I answered the question. And as we're for others to, to raise their hands, I, the point you just made, Yudal, I think is really important. Sometimes we talk about the, um, the inappropriateness of the term reconciliation and that it, we need to talk about just conciliation because there never was a time before when there were good relations. But in this case, there actually was. Um, if we go back far enough, maybe not in the memories of any, certainly not in the memories of anyone who's alive now, um, but the, the original history is of, of peaceful coexistence um, and, and having a common background that is not grounded in hate. And so I think that is also a, a promising connection that can be made. We've got a lot of students. I know students are sometimes hesitant to, to join in and ask questions, but please do. Also our other guests, Julia, go ahead. Okay, so bear with me. I'm still trying to compose this in my head, but I like in America and with American Jews, I feel like so many perceive anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism and often it can be conflated with, like, with that as like the rhetoric used in the States. How would you go about like talking to a person who so strongly like believes in Zionism because of the anti-Semitism that they've experienced? No, I'm, I won't tell anybody that uh, they don't have the right for self-determination. I will not tell anybody that they don't have the right of having their own country, fulfilling their national goals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think one of the biggest grievances and sins Zionism and the State of Israel did to the Jewry of the world is to make uh, Zionism, which is a political method that you can argue about and you can say, which is, it's a good method, it's not a good method, it has its prices, it has, da, 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 anyway. And they made Zionism parallel, if not the same, to Judaism in general. It means that being Jewish, of course you are a Zionist. Well, I say no, I'm a Jewish, I'm not Zionist. I live in Israel, I'm not Zionist. Um, and stating that, now I know it's also a big debate inside American Jewry, whether uh, Jews, wherever they are, are accountable for the deeds of the state of Israel, even if they didn't step there, didn't, uh, didn't be, haven't been here never in their, in their life. Now I know it's a big debate and this is your debate, you can, have it to yourself. But I must say that from here, where I stand, is that US dollars pay for the bullets that are amputating legs on the border in Gaza. US dollars are paying for the bombs that have been dro uh, dropped in Gaza. US dollars have been paying for the wall, uh, the apartheid wall that we've been building uh, in the West Bank. The entrenchment, of US interests in this conflict, economic and otherwise, is so deep that I don't think anybody that their taxes are paying for this, my taxes as well, of course, have the privilege of being silent. You know, remember the silence of our friends. And this is here, I'm paraphrasing uh, my father uh, that says, um, you know, my, my grandfather, um, uh, was an Auschwitz uh, survivor. He used to call himself an Auschwitz graduate. Now, the US didn't get involved in the war in, up to 1942, up to the point where many, 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 many Jews and other uh, marginalized communities of Europe were already lost. Now, the world has its history of being bystander. Being a bystander towards any kind of injustice even more so if this injustice is being carried out by your name. And this is, you know, this is something, that, if I'm thinking about myself in your shoe, this, this is the, the huge uh, uh, reason to be outraged. This, this is done by, by your name. You have nothing to do with it maybe, but it's done by your name. You don't have the privilege to stand, um, to be a bystander in this kind 
of topics. And I think to, towards any injustice, you know, in the, we can say the same thing about Yemen, we can say the same thing about what happened in Syria, what happens in Syria, we can say the world is in turmoil due to the current power balance, which we are all part of. And this is not something that we can um, uh, reject from us, in my opinion. And so the next hand that I see is actually from one of our faculty members, Kent Scholl from the Department of History. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yigal. Thank you uh, to IGMAP for hosting this and allowing, making it uh, coincide with our class. I'm teaching a class right now uh, on uh, forced migration in the Middle East from the 19th through the 20th centuries to the present. And one of the things we're looking at is trying to bring uh, these different punctuated, often focused on punctuated types of displacement, forced displacement of, of people together to look at the systemic problems and to focus on uh, realizing the humanity that's going on. And so, Yigal, thank you very much for what you've shared and, and your focus. Um, one question I, I, would, I would like to have you address, if you can, um, is this and you have in some part, but to address a little bit more or comment on it, is this continued forced displacement of populations and people on a systemic uh, a systemic scale, particularly against Palestinians, but also what has been done uh, to Jews to be able to talk about this in, in the same space in some ways, uh, recognizing the, the power dynamics and the imbalance. So thank you very much, Yigal. Um, well, that's... Uh... Uh, that's a complicated question. It's, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Since you're an historian, I need to be extra careful. No, no, it is, uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not nitpicking. <laughs> um, I, I, I will say. Uh, I will say this. Um, I used to work uh, for an NGO that deals with the uh, joint youth partnership in the educational sense uh, in Jaffa and uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, during uh, my work, though, we wrote a tour a booklet um, uh, stating the history, uh, tracing the history of uh, Jaffa under Israeli rule. Now, one of the most evident things that you see, especially in Jaffa, but it happens all over uh, between the Jordan River and the sea, is this dynamic of, on one hand, now Jaffa is a city that has been, you know, uh, it was called the bride of the sea. It was the most cosmopolitan intellectual uh, center of Palestine. Uh, under uh, British rule and Ottoman rule, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. After the 1948 war, 3,500 Palestinians only were left in Jaffa. That's over 95% of the uh, refugee population that left Jaffa. Jaffa was a city, the whole metropolitan was a city of almost 120,000 people. Po the next day after the occupation of Jaffa, 3,500 people. Now this is the same for many places. Tiberias, Haifa had 3,000 people left, et cetera, et cetera. What you see that after the refugee population, Palestinian refugee population, which is also you know, a, a, a kind of a misleading term because we're talking about or Greek Orthodox, Armenian Christians, Maronites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, left Jewish refugees and immigrants from both Muslim countries who um, were deported many of the Jews living inside them after the 1948 war. Uh, both Jews from Arab countries and from Balkan countries and from European countries post the Holocaust are coming inside and they are being housed in the same houses of the Palestinian refugees. Now, you sit in front of this history and for me, you know, <laughs> I'm completely speechless. What can I say? Can I call them usurpers? Can I call them thieves? People that had nothing entered the homes of people that were completely stripped from everything. You know, it's a situation that finding a just uh, solution in, in, in mind, you know, looking at this history simply is, is crazy. But what you can say is that Israel, the state of Israel, the Zionist movement, using its institutional uh, arms. Now, this is specifically, we're talking about public housing, but we can see it uh, also in uh, afforestation, for example, of uh, Palestinian rural areas that uh, many trees have been planted on, etc. Many, many, many institutional branches of the state of Israel are using the kind of uh, social welfare, socialist dynamic that used to, we used to have 
in order to enforce and to entrench and to become and make it uh, harder and harder to solve uh, the reality between Jews and Palestinians. Okay. And now, if we're talking about new processes, let's take the uh, example of the neighborhood of Givat Amal in northern Tel Aviv. Givat Amal is formerly known as the uh, village of Jamusin el Gharbi, which was a Palestinian village. After 1948, the Palestinian population deported, uh, fl fled, whatever uh, you'd like to call it. After 1948, they housed their uh, Jewish refugees from Morocco. And now they're building towers on top of that neighborhood and kicking out those <laughs> Moroccan Jews that the state put there in the first place. Okay, and you, you see this dynamic coming again and again and again and again. And of course, you see it even greater in mostly Palestinian populated areas of uh, inside 48. And this is of course not talking at all about what Israel is currently doing in the West Bank, uh, forcing uh, many farmers in the West Bank and other areas constantly away from their land using um, what Israel likes to call illegal settlements. Every settlement is illegal, um, but uh, in one hand, we don't, we don't like the settlers, we call them illegal, but on the other hand, the military is always uh, making sure that they can do whatever they do. Okay, so this is something that's still ongoing. I, I hope uh, I was able to, uh, to answer that. Thank you very much, Igor. Sorry to have asked you such a difficult question. <laughs> uh, I, I, actually, if I, I, if I could talk about this, it would be, <laughs> it would be. Sarah, go ahead. Hi, um, so my name is Sarah and um, I'm actually, uh, I was really inspired by your story and I'm really happy to be a part of this Zoom. And thank you so much, Professor Kent, for sharing with us this event, because it also allowed me to see uh, one of my favorite professors, Professor Lear Lemon, who was actually one of my first classes that allowed me to talk about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict um, from an unbiased perspective, uh, growing up as a Muslim Arab in an Arab country in Egypt. Um, I had almost like kind of a biased perspective, obviously, you know, free Palestine, uh, you know, we got a bike, got Israeli products, stuff like that, different things. And um, I feel what you've brought to the table to today in terms of, you know, seeing the bo both sides of the story and really understanding what it's like to be a Palestinian and also what it's like to be a displaced Jewish person is um, very important. But what I wanted to ask you is a question about actually the IDF. Um, do you feel that there is a part of the IDF that's actually like, in a way, you know, not like that doesn't involve hurting like Palestinians? Uh, because one of my friends, she's actually uh, Jewish and her sister is really keen to go to the IDF. And I was like, how, like, how could you be keen to go to the IDF in a way? Because like, you know, it's very problematic. And, you know, like you said, your uniform says a lot. Um, so I was just wondering. <laughs> يعطيكي ألف عافية سارة شكرا على السؤال. As I said earlier, I think the equivalence you need to do in your head that I suggest that you that you might do is that of an 18 year old American before going to college. Okay. For us growing up here, we cannot. You know, the possibility of not going to the IDF is something that you receive either from your family, if you have people in your family who are critical, and et cetera. And it costs not going to the IDF. Um, a lot of dealing with, you know, there is 50%, uh, this is the written number, some say it's higher. 50% of those who need to go to the IDF don't go. Now they don't go to the IDF, not because they're refusing or taking a political stance, because they, need to work for the family. Uh, they feel it won't be good for them uh, speaking about their ment uh, mental health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there are methods to do that. They're illegal methods, but there are methods. Now, in order to ask uh, a normative, mainstream uh, Jewish Israeli girl who wants to do good to her society, who wants to be part of her society, wants to be able to speak up in a society. This is what I thought, that I won't be able to speak up, that no one would listen to me if I wouldn't go to the IDF. Now, the demand of not going is very, 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 very difficult. Of course, I can relate and understand and sympathize with the political 
base of the demand. But reality, of course, is much more uh, complicated. Now, my advice in that sense, if you're close uh, to that specific uh, teenager, is uh, to highlight those problematic parts, uh, to speak about them, to make it part of the conversation, the decision, of course, like the same decision of being part of the, in this kind of activity, the decision of going or not going, it's an individual decision that one needs to feel inside. Um, but once it's inside the conversation, it, it is much easier to highlight. Especially with the historical, uh, let's say, current uh, in Israel, which the IDF slowly loses more and more of its public prestige. Okay? It is not a done deal, it is a long process, but this is uh, what's happening uh, now. I hope I was able to answer the question. Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. What other questions do people have? Go ahead, go ahead, Nicholas. Um, well, I'm oh, sorry, Zephyr. Um, I just wanted to first off, thank you for coming here and um, just sharing your story. Um, I really appreciate just hearing it um, and your openness. Um, so just thank you for that. But my question is, you mentioned in one of your responses how it's so important not to be, <clears throat> sorry, how it's so important not to be a bystander. Um, I was wondering, I was wondering how you think countries um, can best be allies and not be a bystander without um, veering into intervention, which we've seen numerous times is not really helpful to solving any issues. And I was wondering if there's any country's specific approach. That you I'm sorry, I had some uh, uh, internet issues. They're okay now, but if you can start okay. again. Sorry, I wasn't here for the oh, Sorry. Um, my question is about, um, you mentioned in one of your responses that it's important not to be a bystander. I, I was just wondering um, how, how you think countries um, and groups can best not be a bystander without veering into intervention, which we've seen is not really helpful in solving any of these issues. Um, and if there's any specific approach um, by a country that you found particularly exemplary. Yeah, that's a tricky question, um, but I'll try and answer it to the best of my ability. Um, I think specifically, and this is what I know, so this is what I will say uh, regarding the uh, Palestinian cause or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the Zionist-Palestinian conflict would be more accurate to say. You have many, many, many ways to become involved, uh, whether it is in student organizations that differ, you know, have a political range, um, whether it is in off-campus uh, organizations in the States, whether it is in initiatives that, uh, you know, put um, in front of them uh, um, creating economic pressure, whether it is initiatives that put in front of them uh, bringing Jews and Palestinians and Arabs together. Um, the only thing you need to do is, is go online. Now, the question of effectivity, um, I think in any kind of uh, social struggle or uh, the fight towards justice, etc., is something that we cannot um, assess uh, very well. Um, I don't know if what we're doing is very effective. I know that if one of the students in the classrooms that I'm speaking uh, is thinking that I might be right, then I did my share, uh, of course, my very small share. Um, so in, in that sense, I just, I'll just say, and I'm saying this with caution, and this is my own personal opinion, it is not um, the official stand of the parent circle, um, is that uh, in the last term, in the last government we had, they founded an office, this uh, government office, which is called uh, the government to deal, uh, the, uh, translating freely, uh, the strategic, uh, no, you mean strategic, the, the office to deal with the strategic threats. 
Um, this was uh, founded uh, by the Likud party, the Netanyahu's party. And uh, basically, it is a very well budgeted uh, government branch, which their almost only job is to fight the BDS. Now that means that the Israeli nuclear superpower, regional nuclear superpower, is terrified by young activists who are taking a stand. That might be effective. Well, while we're waiting for the, oh, there we go. Kerry, go ahead. Hi, Egal. Thank you so much uh, for speaking with us today. Uh, I asked a similar question to your father and Bassam earlier this week, and I'm curious to hear your response. One of the factors that um, that continues to cause uh, are, are, are rifts and 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 and, and uh, issues with with building peace in the region relates to the way that the past and especially memories of past atrocities are activated in the present, whether that be with the Holocaust or the Nakba. In your work and when you speak to people, how do you advocate for remembering the past, acknowledging its very real impacts, but at the same time, not allowing it to be an obstacle in building peace in the present? First of all, I agree with my father and Bassam completely, whatever they said. That's, that's a starting point. Um, now now I, need to, I need to ask my dad to write me in the WhatsApp what, what he said, so we'll be uh, compatible. Um, I'll tell you this. My grandfather, uh, Yitzhak, um, we said was in Auschwitz, a graduate, his honeymoon with my grandmother, who, by the way, grew up in the old city before 1948 and could cook beautifully all the cuisines around her neighborhood which was Palestinian, Caucasian, uh, Ashkenazi, etc. Uh, as a, an example, a living, almost living example, she passed away last year of this distant memory of life together. Um, their honeymoon was in Germany. They went to see Berlin, they went to see the Reichstag, the uh, important uh, German uh, uh, cultural heritage, as you know. And, and, and I asked him uh, at the point, how, how could you do that? He drove a Volkswagen. And um, he said, it's over. Now, I'm less, um, my, father, my grandfather was a, a good forgiving Jew. Uh, now I'm a little bit more angry uh, than he was. I think I would have been less uh, you know, easy with that kind of thing. But this comes to teach us that the person that's been through those atrocities, when given, given the chance to move on and to live his life well, this is what he does. And I think this is the, I'll say carefully, this will also could be the situation, God will, um, with the Palestinian Aqaba in the 1948 war. Now, I wish for the day that sitting in a classroom in university and uh, the, the, the opening statement would be like the one the, uh, that Nadia did in the beginning of our session. If we'll sit in the University of Tel Aviv and people will say this university was built on the lands uh, and on the physical homes of the village of Shahmu Annes, uh, which uh, its inhabitants now live in, etc., 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 etc. Now, the road to correction, I believe, goes through that. And of course, through uh, physical, proper financial reparations. And this is everything that I'm saying, take it as, uh, you know a suggestion from, uh, from a Jew, <laughs> and let's, let's leave the Palestinians away uh, to, to agree uh, on what kind of reparations is suitable. But what I'm saying is that this is possible. Many places around the world who are unfortunately been through atrocities uh, in bigger numbers than the ones that we had here have moved past it and through it. Whatever is done is done. Of course, we need to acknowledge the past. We need to offer our forgiveness, offer our apologies and hope for forgiveness. Um, but it happened. And now Bassam, uh, Arab's father, always says in lectures, if there's an Israeli embassy in, Be in Berlin and a German embassy in Tel Aviv, everything can happen. We did not kill 6 million Palestinians and the uh, Palestinians did not kill 6 million Jews. It's different. If this can happen, anything can happen. 
and I will take his words uh, to answer that. I'm going to go to Gregory next um, to recognize who haven't yet asked a question. Oh, hey, you go. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives. So really incredible and so interesting. Um, I have a question just about to what extent in your education when you were growing up and just in society as a whole in Israel, like to what extent um, nationalism is taught in schools and if at all that affected you or you or and just Zionism as well, if that I mean it had an impact in your um, in your childhood or you know uh, academic career. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Now, I, I never, I, I was never asked to stand up and uh, recite the national anthem uh, every morning in class. Um, but um, of course, it was taught, and of course, it is more and more and more and more um, as the political reality is escalating, and as the Ministry of Education is being handed to uh, far right uh, nationalistic parties. Uh, like the Jewish home and etc. Now translating it makes it sound much, much worse. The Jewish home. Um, it's a party that uh, the former uh, minister of education, the former former minister of education, is part of. Um, now, growing up, and uh, you know, I told you all about my um, radical, uh, my radical parents that pissed me off completely when growing up. I became a very, very strong Zionist. Um, you know, my grandfather uh, was a general in the Six Days War. Before that, he fought in the 1948 war. My mother's grandfather uh, signed the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence, what you can really call, you know, a Zionist. Uh, we have Zionist legacy, Zionist history, and I hold, held on uh, to that very, 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 very uh, carefully. Um, and I think it started to crack joining the military realizing the classes, the different classes uh, inside Israelis, inside Israel Jewish society, inside my own personal base. You know, what, what I did in the, in the army most of the time um, was uh, I was a commander or an instructor of what you can call uh, the translation is the youth brigade. Gadna, uh, Gdudei Noar. And these are 16 year olds that come and simulate a week of basic training. Now I was a commander, so I was the top of the base, etc. Of course, I wasn't a combatant, so in the military hierarchy and even lower. Um, but together with me were drivers and cooks and uh, cleaners. And all of a sudden I started seeing that I come from a certain descent and my peers are coming from a certain descent, all European Jewish families. And the rest are coming from different parts of the world. I had the Georgian uh, driver friend, I had the Moroccan Jewish uh, cook friend. And I'm I will share with you something else in that, in that perspective uh, of, the, of the de Zionization of uh, what happened. I, I, I was caught doing something I shouldn't have been uh, doing. I was uh, drinking on, uh, on base together with, uh, with the cook, the driver, et cetera, et cetera. And I was court martialed. Now, what the thing that the uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel, which was head of whatever, uh, said um, was not you were caught drinking, etc. You were caught drinking with them. Now that says everything and that at the time told me everything. What should they think? What should they believe? Etc. And to get back to your question, which I completely answered a different question. Um, is that it is very, very um, potent and it is very, very, um, and it holds a great deal of uh, the curricula being inside uh, mainstream uh, Jewish education. And that being said, you also have non formal um, civic society kind of uh, intellectual uprising of the um, Arab Jewish past. So these two things combined manage to level one another, sort of. But as the years go by and as the political system is shifting more and more to the right, uh, national content and Zionist history and et cetera is more and more part of uh, the curricula. Uh, by the way, and this is to my remark at the beginning, I'm not sure it's, as much, more, it's much different than any other uh, nation state 
And again, I was never forced uh, to sing the national anthem uh, in class. And I know you had your hand up sooner, but I'm gonna go give student preference. So Sarah, you're up next. Um, so I just also had another question. So uh, I think in the past year, um, more Arab countries started recognizing like Israel and like not recognizing, but like making peace treaties like UAE or is now like making, um, you know, like more, uh, like just more acceptance of Israeli people and trying to get like this whole like stigma around Israeli people um, out of the picture. And I know also Sudan did something and like, all these efforts. Do you think those are actually mending or helping the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or are they just furthering Israeli agenda or which one is it? Or is it something no. else? I don't know. I think we need to ask, uh, first of all, I need to say, you know, a statement. Uh, these are not uh, doing any kind of service. These accords are not doing any service to the Israel-Palestinian uh, conflict. They're not doing any service to the relations between Jewish and Palestinians inside uh, Israel and uh, outside. Um, but the world also has its own way to move things. Now, I'm not a prophet. I don't know what these accords will create. I am curious to see, uh, you know, the view from uh, uh, from the tower in, uh, in Dubai. Um, but, but, but I think this question, uh, of course, it's, it's, it's very important and intelligent, but I think it maybe could be premature uh, realizing what the effect will truly be in the region. I know that we have peace with Egypt. I haven't been to Iskandaria, I haven't been to Cahira, I haven't been to the places that I want to go in Egypt. And uh, because it's difficult to get a visa and maybe I'm not welcome and maybe uh, the, my country doesn't want me to go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now there's a big difference between a peace accord and living together in peace like our region knew how uh, a, few, a century ago. Um, that's this we can say that we will see, but it does. Uh, um, and if I could say that, and I'm saying that carefully, um, it can indicate that the Arab world might have shifted a little bit in his stance towards uh, Israel in the Middle East, and that may be that may that probably means, and this is tragically a forsaking a little bit the Palestinian uh, agenda and cause. Now, what else will happen? Yes. No, that makes perfect sense. Thank you so much. Thank you. Go ahead, Ken. I won't ask such a difficult question this time, but you, you referenced a couple of things, Igal, uh, that I thought were really important, and that was the, the, the Ministry Against Strategic Threats and BDS, Strategic which is Boycott, threats. Divestment, and Sanctions. And I, I uh, for, for, I'm sorry, I just I wanted to make sure we haven't had a chance to talk about that in our, our class yet. Um, but I was curious if you could talk about some of the how those two are engaging in in, in some cases on on either sides or multiple sides of this uh, uh, of this issue, um, how that's affecting your efforts, you Autumn's efforts, and other things, in terms of trying, is it being characterized as selling out to BDS because your your dialogue is normalcy, or is it and it's seen what you're doing as a, a strategic threat? By the min by the ministry, I just wanted to offer that. Uh, ask that. Thank you. Uh, that, that's a, that's a great question, and thank you for asking it. Um, first of all, I say uh, the coming to the Zionist Palestinian conflict or to the relations between Jews and Palestinians, everybody has a very strong step. Everybody's sure what's right. Everybody's sure how we should lead our lives and what we should do with them, and etc. 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 Now, a question, a, a lesson in. Uh, humility and uh, humbleness to the world in that in that respect i think is important um now as i said i'm not i'm not opposed to bds i'm not opposed to sanctions i, I think it was clear uh, from what i said earlier and um, telling you that this serves our specific work the best way it can i'm not sure uh, the problem of normalization between the Arab world and especially in Palestinian society with Jews in Israel is a real thing. Uh, people um, are more and more afraid. This is why, again, our Palestinian counterparts and partners are so 
um, are so filling with inspiration because they are facing criticism, which may be a just criticism regarding that uh, sense of normalization. And every day that Palestinians are willing to continue and work with Israeli Jews is a, is a day that I say thank you and God bless that it, this still happens. And I fear the day that it will not happen for us, by the way, I'm not sure it serves them right, but for us, for Israeli society. That being said, um, and this is something, you know, apropos the, the humility and the humbleness that we talked about in the beginning, I don't know. This might work, this might not work. As long as something will move this almost, you know, it's the most difficult to, to imagine the end of this thing. As long as something will move us towards it, thank God that it happens. How it happened, what kind of prices we will need to pay, we will become... Uh, like, uh, I don't know, white, white population uh, in South Africa after the boycott? Will, we, uh, will, will it be the situation of the international uh, uh, seclusion, although it doesn't look like that, of uh, Iran at the point that we become poorer and poorer and poorer and uh, I will not be able to uh, speak at a conference in, uh, in the United States and et cetera, et cetera. I don't know what the price we need to pay, but as long as there is an active, uh, effective, uh, action against occupation and against Israel's policy, if it manages to shift something, thank God. And unfortunately, Israel, with its policies, is proving once and again that this works. Why else would they have founded that office and gave it millions and millions and millions of budget to fight against, I don't know, 13 activists in the campus of UCLA? It's, it's like they're imagining this kind of military, this organ. We're talking about, uh, about activists, my age, your age, you know, people that are speaking their mind. This, of course, are, you know, bad, uh, bad parts of the BDS and this uh, marginal uh, anti-Semitic kind of uh, approach to it. We're not talking about that. I'm talking the mainstream uh, leadership of the organization led by Barhuti and et cetera. We are but I'm gonna try and squeeze in one more question from Musa. Um, I have a follow-up question regarding BLS. Um, at the risk of speaking for an entire group of people, what do um, Israelis, uh, what, are Isra what are normal Israeli citizens stance on BDS? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, anti-Semitism, it comes to destroy us, it's, uh, uh, it's, fringe, it's weird, it's uh, the reincarnation of the biggest, you know, threats to the Jewish people. And this is something that, again, uh, what I said about the military and etc. If, if I could add a bit of, uh, let's say, compassion uh, to the stand. And I understand that fully. People that live their lives completely segregated from the problem that they have created. People that live their lives with not knowing, you know, most of the Israelis, I, do, I haven't done the statistics, but if I'll, if I'll do them, I think about 90% of Israelis never been to the West Bank. Even a lower number spoke to Palestinians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is not part of their everyday life. This is also one of the most hor horrific things about this occupation and conflict that it doesn't touch us until it does, like the story of my family. But they think about people that support the BDS, that they are complete um, Jew haters, and that they are led by the same kind of uh, motivation um, as uh, the, the monsters in the past that did whatever they did to annihilate us. And, you know, collective memory and trauma is something that people have. You, you know, and they have all kinds of thoughts due to that. It's, part, it's embedded in us. But we have a society here that grew up fearing this kind of Im now imaginary, it wasn't imaginary in the past, uh, German boogeyman under our beds. This is the kind of uh, mindset that, you know, everybody's coming for us and et cetera, et cetera, until we got a state, they want to take the state. Now, in order to break that, and this is maybe something, uh, it is uh, you know, a suggestion BDS movements, etc. I don't know who am I to suggest such things, but uh, if I can, is, is to create, uh, not, not to give up on dialogue. There's a difference. There's a difference between speaking to the Israeli common man and woman, and there's a difference between speaking to the Ministry of Defense and to Elbit and to other corporations. You know, uh, making uh, a corporation defund 
uh, their uh, enterprises in Israel is not the same as speaking to your fellow student or to uh, your peer. Um, yeah. Thank you, that makes a lot of sense. Yigal, I wanna be respectful of, of your time and, and everyone's time. Um, this is your stories. <laughs> We, we titled this week Stories of Loss and Reconciliation from the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, but I really think um, beyond the stories of loss and reconciliation, they are stories of, of inspiration, stories of the power of storytelling, um, and the, the power of um, working together. Um, so that, that joint activism that you spoke about um, so powerfully, I, I think is a really important takeaway um, for all of us from, from this conversation for so many contexts, because there are conflicts in so many places that have parallel elements in the sense of, you know, the, we don't know the other side. We only know this, this boogeyman image of the other side um, that we perpetuate through um, the narrative of institutions rather than the stories of, of people. Um, so I really appreciate you, you taking um, time to share that with us and talk with us today. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to join us. Please give him our, our regards. Um, tell him that um, you represented him well. We shared, we uh, looked at the video. Um, we, we, are, we are standing in solidarity with all of you and, and we're so appreciative of your, of your work um, and your willingness to, to share it with us. So. Um, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for attending. Quick reminder, we do have a couple of wrap up events tomorrow, um, which um, are really just kind of for debriefing. If you attended one or you attended all, um, please feel free to come join us for a little bit of reflections on um, what, we've, what we've learned over the course of the week, um, how it's changing, how we're thinking. And then after that, we'll have a short session um, the first one at 11, Reflections, and then at noon, if you want to know more about IGMAP activities and opportunities, you're welcome to join us for that. So thank you, everybody. I wish you all health and safety, um, and take care. Thank you for having me, and thank you for listening. And thanks, Rami, for joining us again. I want to know what teenager taught you how to use emojis so well. I was so proud. Thank you. Self-taught, a complete. He's, he's much better with emojis than I am. Yeah, it's like he's like twelve or something. <laughs> he can type out entire sentences in emojis. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nadia, especially. Thank you, thank Igor. You. Really appreciate you. Thanks. Thank you. This was really fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Nadia, you you wanted me to stay, right? Yeah. We have the. Yeah, you know, I actually I ended up recording this session. I initially had thought that I perhaps wasn't going to record the the stories themselves and that I would ask you to recount them. But I think because I recorded this whole thing, we're fine. Great. So thank you very much. Sorry for being uh, so difficult to communicate with at the beginning, but uh, it was a great... Yeah.